Good morning, everybody. It is indeed great to see you here on a beautiful Sabbath day. I am so happy you have chosen to worship with us. We will be continuing our study this week in the book of Colossians. This will be the third, and we will actually make it through the first chapter today. We will not get to verses 1 through 5 of chapter 2, as I'd hoped. We're getting there. We will be there next week. And I hope you're enjoying the series. I, th I, I find this a very interesting series, but sometimes what I find interesting, others don't, but I hope that you do enjoy this. Our scripture reading for the benefit of those that are unable to attend in person, but watch it online, our, our scripture readings today come from the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 89 for the first, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for the second. So let's go to Psalms chapter 89. We're going to take a look at verses 24 through 29. We will take a look at verses 24 through 29 in Psalms chapter 89. Let's begin there. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and my name shall be his horn, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. Excuse me. Also I will set his hand over the sea, and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep to him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. Verse 29. And his seed also... I will make to endure forever, and his throne as in the days of heaven. It's an interesting passage, but for the rest of our scripture reading, let's turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll take a quick look at verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God... I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Let's quickly bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our dear, kind, and gracious, and kind, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity and a beautiful Sabbath day to be able to worship together. and. I ask that the hearts of each and every one that is here in our congregations or are watching this online, that our hearts will be open, that the Holy Spirit will, will give us the message that you want us to hear to be able to hear today. And I ask that I hide behind the scripture readings and that the words that I speak be your words and not my words. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to the book of Colossians. Comes right, comes shortly after the book of First and Second Corinthians. It's uh, just before. Or it's the last of the four books that make up "Go Eat Popcorn." Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and finally Colossians. We'll be in verse our chapter 1 again this week. We will be able to finish this, this this week, at least chapter 1, before going on to chapter 2 next week. We have talked about the centrality of Christ and what Christ has done for us and the fact that he has reconciled us to Christ and our, to God and that because of Christ's life, his sinless life, his perfect life, and his assumption of sin unto himself, that we are able to stand before God completely reconciled as though we are sinless. We have also looked at the fact that we need to accept this, or it is our faith in this, that causes us to become saved. But we've also looked at the fact that there are two separate forms of faith. One is a genuine faith, 
and one is an ungenuine faith. The genuine faith looks to God and sees what God has done on his behalf in the sending of Christ to assume our sins unto himself and to die in our place, thus reconciling us before God, which then strengthens our faith and enhances our love for what God and Christ has done for us, wanting us then to, well, wanting the Holy Spirit to dwell in us to effect change from the inside out so that I become more Christ-like versus ungenuine faith. Ungenuine faith is very quick and simple to explain, and I hope you get it, but you look at all this that we have gone through, but now you want to project this onto somebody else as the medieval Christian church did, who lost their love and now turned it into a series of works and tried to force their opinion upon others, which resulted in persecution. Yes, it resulted in persecution and oftentimes exhibits itself within our own church the same way in that we project our faith upon others, convinced that we will be able to save them. And I often equate it simply to this, salvation by vegetarianism. We attempt to, in some cases, put this on to other people who are willing or aren't ready for it because genuine faith seeks a change within me so that Christ lives through me to draw others to Christ so that the Holy Spirit can effect a change in them as in me where ungenuine faith causes me to project what I want to see happen in their life. And it's not that we don't want to see others saved. It's not that we don't want to see others have a relationship with God. That's not it. Ungenuine faith is projecting onto others what you yourself believe in order to affect change in them. But we're going to pick it up today in verse 24 of Colossians chapter 1. Verse 24 in Colossians chapter 1. And so I'm going to read this and then I'm going to go through and explain what this first verse of the, of the six verses that we're going to take a look at today, what this first verse is trying to get on. And we finished last week with verse 23 that says, of which I, Paul, became a minister, which ushers us into this section that we're going to look at today. And so, I, Paul, became a minister, verse 24, and now I now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. And this is the second time we've seen in which Paul's referred to the body of Christ being the church with Christ as the head. So elsewhere too, Paul declares that he rejoices in his suffering. We see this in Romans chapter 5 verse 3. The idea of suffering is somehow endured on behalf of the people to whom he writes is not known. But this verse goes further. It does so by, by tying Paul's suffering to the sufferings of Christ. In so doing, Paul raises several problems. The first of the problems is, how can Paul claim what belongs to Christ alone, namely the vocation to suffer on behalf of others. Now, some translations have attempted to de-emphasize this by stating, now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. And it is true that the word 
the Greek word mu or mau, however you'd like to pronounce it, which is our word my, qualifying suffering in the original is lacking from most transcripts or manuscripts. But the RSV, in supplying it, now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, has only brought out the force of the definite article, article before the word sufferings, and should be taken in the light of the whole verse, as we would see if we took a look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13. This begs us to ask the question, how can Paul claim that in the sufferings he is able to fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church? This is what the question is begging us to take a look at, or the verse is begging us to take a look at. How can anything be lacking in the sufferings of Christ? Supporters of rival theories of this atonement have always regarded this first, or at least their opponent's handling of it, with deep suspicion, and we probably should as well, but such fears are unnecessary if we fully understand Paul's world of thought. Remember, Paul is a Jew. He's not only a Jew, but he's a member of the um, Sanhedrin, or was a member of the Sanhedrin. He's been trained as a rabbi, and so Paul has an understanding of that culture and that thinking over and beyond, uh, beyond us. But two ideas form or ideas from Paul's Jewish understanding of God helps us to see what he means. First, corporate Christology is expressed in the second half of the verse by the concept of the church as Christ's body. That which is true of Christ is also then true of his people. As Christ suffered, you and I often suffer. But the second point Paul's trying to make is that there is a concept of the mosaic woes which Paul also alludes to as we see in Romans chapter 8 verses 18 to 25. The later ideal developed from the Old Testament which hints by some intertestamental writings, the intertestamental writings are those that are included in some Bibles but not most Protestant Bibles that, taught, that were written between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament over about a four, four and a, 400, 450 year period of time. And it is a view that is also shared by several rabbinic writings of that period. A view shared by Jesus and Paul is that world history is divided into a present age, which is the evil age, as seen in Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, and the age to come when the great moment arrives for history to move from one age to the next, God's people will suffer extraordinary tribulations. These tribulations are to be understood as the birth pangs of a new age. We actually see this in history when we look at the early Christian church as it suffered from the hands of Judaism, but also suffered from the hands of of paganism and pagan Rome. But we also see this in Romans chapter 8, verse 22. They are to be a accompaniment or perhaps foreshadowing of the appearance of the Messiah. Foreshadowing of the appearance of the Messiah, as you saw some birth pangs before Christ was born, you're also going to see birth pangs as Christ nears his second coming. Like all of Paul, 
reusing of Jewish material. His ideas are reshaped by the fact that Jesus' death and resurrection, let me make sure I stated that correctly. I'm, I'm not sure that I did, so let me say, like all of Paul's reusing of Jewish material, his ideas are reshaped by the fact of Jesus' death and resurrection. There, I know I said it right. Instead of the old and new ages standing, as it were, back to back, he understood them as overlapping. In other words, he understood them as overlapping. With Jesus' resurrection, the new age was inaugurated or began but the old age, the present evil age, would continue alongside it until Jesus' second coming. The whole period between the Lord's resurrection and his return was the period of the turnaround of the eras. Therefore, the entire period would be characterized by the messianic woes. Such suffering is actually regarded as evidence that the sufferers of God are God's new people. That the sufferers are God's new people. This suffering is why Paul rejoices in suffering instead of merely rejoicing in the midst of or despite suffering. He freely chose and is recognized in his risen body marks, this would be Jesus, of the nails in his hands and feet and the mark of the spear in his side, as we see in Luke chapter 24, verse 39, and John 20, verse 20 and 25 and 20 through 27. So God's people are to be recognized for the suffering that they endure. And in the garden, and pay close attention, and in the garden, secretly as in Gethsemane, and on the cross on high, should teach his brethren and inspire them to suffer and die to self and want to be like Christ. Therefore, as true Christians are not merely imitating him, they are incorporated into his life in his new way of life. In this sense, Paul can speak of filling up the afflictions of the Messiah. He is not adding to the achievements of Calvary, this he would never attempt to do. He is merely putting into practice the principles of which Calvary was, in one sense, the supreme working, outworking. He understood the vocation of the church as being to suffer. Paul does not claim this privilege just for himself, as though he were independent of Christ, but rightly sees that it is his that it is his precisely because it is Christ, and so he, as Christ, therefore we are all Christ. He means this when he writes of suffering of Christ that we see in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, or sharing of the fellowship of Christ's suffering that we see in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. This is the correct approach to the verse is confirmed by two other considerations. First, the interchange between Christ and Paul permeates the whole paragraph, not merely the verse that we see, especially when we look at verse 29, which we will get to shortly. Second, the parallel passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, and 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, 12 possesses in fuller detail 
and is less cryptic, expressing the same combination of elements. Paul therefore applies to himself the same pattern of suffering on behalf of others that has worked out or what was worked out on the cross. He does not think of saving the Colossians from their own sin and its consequences. This never crosses Paul's mind because Christ has already done this work, but he may perhaps save them some present suffering, and we may ask ourselves, how is it that Paul will save them some present suffering by drawing the enemy's fire to himself so that he may allow the young churches a young church a bit of respite from the fierce attacks they might otherwise be facing there may also be here the idea of a fixed amount of suffering to endure in the dawning of the messianic age paul delights in taking as much of it as he can in order to spare others the same suffering. In so doing, he is hoping to hasten the Lord's return. If these ideas sound strange to us, to our modern ears, this may be true, but not so much due to the distance between Paul and us as it is in time and culture. It sounds odd because the church has forgotten how to apply itself to apply itself and that it is the body of the crucified Messiah. Three details, two of exegetic nature and one of application remain. Number one, as in English, the word now at the start of the verse is not a mere transition word. What is not clear is whether it is in verse one, temp- or temporal, referring to rejoicing which Paul now has while in prison as opposed to that which he had before, and two, logistically or logically referring to the fact that he can rejoice now because of the truths he has just been rehearsing, as we saw in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Truthfully, the latter seems more probable. Paul's reason for his rejoicing in what Christ has done will be re- removed when he is released from prison. I said that wrong. I want to make sure that I say that right. Paul's reason for rejoicing in what Christ has done will not be removed, and I missed the word not, will not be removed when he is released from prison. Paul will still be able to rejoice for the exact same reasons for what Christ has done. Second, the word rendered, fill up, has another preposition attached to it. The first three letters of the word in Greek is A-N-T, ante, which, which, which we get our word anti or opposite of. If the preposition anti will have the effect of emphasizing that what Paul is suffering. He is suffering in some way, not merely on behalf of the young church, but actually instead of the church. And thirdly, we would be wrong to think of suffering only in terms of outward direct persecution that professing Christians sometimes undergo because of their faith. The church must, it is true, always be ready for such persecution 
and must support in prayer and practical help those that are facing it. But all Christians will suffer for their faith in one way or another. And that's a terrible thing to have to say, but it is true. We are all, at some point in our life, going to have to suffer because of our faith. If not outwardly, sometimes we can visibly, people can visibly see that we're suffering. We've lost our job. Something has happened that is causing us to physically suffer. People can see that. But there's also another type of suffering that is talked about. And that is the inward struggle through the long, slow battle with temptation and sickness. And I'm beginning to understand, having never really technically been addicted to anything except food, I have been studying and researching and trying to understand addictions, and I am finally beginning to understand what a long, slow battle addictions can be. And oftentimes, what a long, slow battle sickness can also be. And the, in, and the agonizing anxiety of Christian responsibility for a family or a church can also cause us to be inwardly struggling. Paul knew these two as we see in 2 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2, and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 through chapter 3, verse 1. The constant doubts and uncertainty which accompany the obedience of faith and the thousand natural shocks that the flesh is heir to, taken up as they are within the call to follow Christ, all these properly understood are things to, re to rejoice in, not casually or superficially, but because they are signs of the present age is passing away, that the people of Jesus, the Messiah, are the children of the new age, and that the birth pangs of the new age are being worked out in them, as we shall see, this knowledge is about the two ages, forms the basis of Paul's appeal that we will see in chapter 2, verse 20, through chapter 3, verse 4. Which finally brings us to verse five, 25 which reads, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. And by the way, we're breaking these long sentences into little sections. In verse 23, Paul described himself as a servant of the gospel. Here, he sees himself as the servant of the church Paul feels a special responsibility toward the Colossians, yet he has never met the Colossians. But he feels a special responsibility to them as a steward of a great house is entrusted by his master with the responsibility of attending the needs to attend to the needs of his guests. Paul states, I have become it's the church's servant by the commission that God gave me. His task, simply stated, is to, to present the word of God in its fullness. Or more literally, to fulfill the word of God. We should not restrict this phrase to the preaching of the whole counsel of God, not, nor is it a simple matter of making the Word of God fully known. The Word of God is a power power. The Word of God is a power let loose upon the world 
embodied in the true gospel message, it must be allowed to have its full effect to be fulfilled in that sense. Which 25 is fairly short. We're through it. Let's go on to verses 26 and 27. The mystery of which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. Verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're going to finish one sentence, and we're going to complete another sentence here with our understanding of these two verses, verses 26 and 27. This thought is confirmed by Paul's further definition of the Word of God. God is the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations. How did this happen? It happened when Adam and Eve sinned at the tree by placing their trust in another instead of placing their trust in God. It created a gulf or separation between Adam and Eve or all of humanity and God the Father. Christ came to bridge that gulf, to close that gulf, to bring us back into connection with the Father. So here again we have Jewish rethought in the light of the gospel. In their looking forward to the day when God would act to restore the fortunes of his people. Some Jews expressed their hopes in terms of the secret plan that God was reserving for that great, for the last great day, the world, or excuse me, the word mystery is properly to be understood against this background. It is God's secret plan which was anticipated and revealed in vision and symbols by holy men of old and now at last unveiled before the people in the life of Christ. The saints are not a restricted group within the church, but the whole people of God we may compare 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 2 through 7, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7 where it says, we speak of God's great wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. In other words, God never planned for us to become separated from him. And let me rephrase that. It wasn't his desire. But in case God had a plan through Christ to reunite us with God. For Paul, God's God's secret plan is not a timetable of events, but a person, and that person is Christ. Within the passage, we see the outworking of Christology in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, and I would like to say 15 through 23, all that God has from the beginning planned to do, he is now done and is is doing in Christ for the sake of the people. Some would say his people, but I honestly believe it's for all people. It's our choice whether we want to accept it or not. To them, God has chosen to make known the glorious riches of his majesty among the Gentiles. See, it's kind of a kind of often stated that. There's a separation that the gospel message was only for the Jews, but when you actually study in to what God wanted the Jews to do, he wanted them to attract others to them 
in order for them to demonstrate who God was. But now today, God wants to live out in each one of us so that we can attract others to God. So the new Israel or the new church or the church at large is to attract the world to Christ through the way that we as Christians live our life in faith and total trust. For Paul's secret, as I stated a moment ago, for Paul, God's secret plan is not a timetable of events, but a person, and that person is Christ. These phrases should perhaps be turned around to bring out the emphasis of the Greek, a literal translation to them God wishes to make known what the riches of his glory, of his mystery among the Gentiles. In other words, God wants to reveal to the whole world who he is. At the center of the ministry, or mystery, excuse me, stands the revelation in Christ that God purposes were not to be restricted to the Jews, but to embrace the entire world. The fact, the riches of the glory of God's plan, God is revealed in Jesus Christ as the Lord of the whole world, and its sovereign and loving creator, but not just a loving creator, but also a loving redeemer. According to Paul's metaphor, looking unto God's astonishing plans is like exploring a palace richly stocked with treasures. Each treasure reveals more fully the last treasure which is the majesty of the owner, which is God as revealed in Christ. Among these treasures is that God's glory is to be shared with the people. This hope of the glory is a certainty because of the mystery itself, which is Christ in you. This could be taken as Christ among you by some, but the you is in plural. So this could be taken as Christ among you, its emphasis being that that of immediately preceding phrase, however, among the Gentiles. The fact that the Jewish Messiah has made his abode among the world's nations shows that God intends their ultimate glorification, but through this sense is thoroughly Pauline. It is probably better to take the phrase in the context of Romans chapter 8, verse 10, where the indwelling of Christ in believers is their guarantee of resurrection. It should be noted that although Christ in you can be truly predicated upon all who are in Christ and vice versa, these two ideas are not the same. Christ indwells by his Spirit in all who are belonging to his family and is is said to be in him. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, provides good examples of both ideas, and so do verses chapter of uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, to our present passage today. Which brings us to our last two texts, and we're quickly running out of time today, but our last two texts, which is uh, verses 28 and 29 of Colossians chapter 1. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching 
every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his works, working which works in me mightily. Christ's design, going back to verse 22, is to present his people to God holy and without reproach. Paul's aim is that he may present everyone perfect in Christ. The parallel reveals again how closely Paul related God's purpose to his own vocation. It is because God is at work that Paul is at work. The paradox capturing so nearly the correct balance between divine sovereignty and human responsibility in the work of Christian ministry comes to a head in verse 29. To this end, it says, and this is speaking, Paul speaking of his, his self, to this end, I labor. But in contrast, human logic would see this as a statement of mere human effort, and effort it is. The word used refers to uncompromising hard work. The whole thought is very close to that of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, which we used for our scripture reading today, the word struggling, whose root can mean to compete in the game, carries, as it often in Paul's idea of athletic context, the highest lo logic of God's work in human beings recognizes a more profound truth. Struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me, is the energy of God's Spirit at work in Paul. Paul does not go around his, go about his work half-heartedly. Christ didn't go about his work of redemption half-heartedly. All of heaven doesn't go about their work half-heartedly. Paul saying, I'm not going about my work half-heartedly, vaguely hoping that grace will fill in the gaps which he is too lazy to work at himself, nor does Paul imagine that it is all up to him so that unless he burns himself out with restless, anxious toil, nothing Nothing will be achieved. He knows that God's desire to bring all Christians to maturity. This has always been God's desire. This is why Paul's wanting us to move from milk to the meat of the gospel is to bring us all to Christian maturity. That God has called him to have a share in that work he can therefore work hard without stressful motivation of either pride or fear. He thus becomes an example of that maturity, both human and Christian, that in that he suffers, or let me rephrase that, that he seeks under God to produce in others. Let me... Go back to there. God has called him to have a share in that work. He can therefore work hard without the stressful motivation of either pride or fear. He thus becomes an example of that maturity, both human and Christian, that he seeks under God to produce in others. In other words, Paul's working to see that Christ is reproduced in each person's heart. The work consists, consists of proclaiming him, that is Christ. This proclamation has a twofold aspect. They are both 
the, 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 these two aspects are admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom and a definite goal so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. And, re- and presenting everyone perfect in Christ is re- repeated three times and at, um, occurring after admonishing as well. This emphasis is that every single Christian is capable of the maturity of which Paul speaks. However, it involves knowledge and wisdom. These are not the, to be weighed on the scale of an ordinary human intellectual ability, but are of the altogether different. Him we proclaim, these words serve for Christian preachers and teachers as a constant reminder of our central calling, not first and foremost to com- comment on current affairs, or to alleviate human problems, although the church should attempt to to alleviate human problems, but really in reality it's God working through the church that does it. They are good and necessary as those activities may be, but to announce to the world that Jesus is Lord. This announcement will, in its detailed application, include admonishing as well as positive teaching. The first word, though sometimes understood as meaning simply putting into the mind, includes the idea of setting of someone's mind into proper order with the implication that it has been in some way out of joint. And boy, isn't that the truth, that sin and separation from God causes our mind to be out of joint, and the preaching and the teaching of the gospel allows it to be put back into place. Positive teaching may not be enough. There is no telling what all has muddled the Christian mind and will get it in that the let me redo this here interestingly positive teaching may not be enough there is no telling what models muddles the christian mind will get into from time to time and part of the task of one who proclaim, who proclaims christ is to straighten out the confusion we may ask what is the confusion The confusion is about who God is and how much God loves them. To search for and tie together correctly the loose ends of half-grasped ideas so that the positive teaching may not be instantly distorted upon reception but may be adequately understood, appreciated, and lived out. Final paragraph. Then it is the goal of of maturity, not perfection in the sense of sinlessness, as Scripture points out, makes clear that we may be in God's sight, mature Christians. The goal is now possible that in Christ, the image of God himself now lives within his people by his spirit, as we saw in Colossians chapter 1, verse 8, working secretly until their life and his, which would be Christ, is indistinguishable in their basic character and true humanity. It's an interesting six verses that we have looked at today. I have taken 45 minutes or 49 minutes, and I am really, really sorry about that. But it's something that I think that 
we as Christians have lost focus of is what our true purpose is. Our true purpose is to present the gospel message and let the Holy Spirit work on the lives of those that we present it to. We are to be that reckless farmer. It doesn't matter the type of soil that it falls upon. The seeds of the gospel should go everywhere. It's up to the Holy Spirit to prepare the hearts for the people to receive it. It's not up to us to change people. And that's the message Paul's trying to get across, is that Paul is willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel message, taking some of the suffering onto himself, which the church has failed to do, in order to nurture and bring along Christians, other Christians, from being baby Christians to mature Christians. This is all Paul's trying to get us to see in these six verses that we had today. And so let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear, kind, and gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to open the Scriptures and study today. And we ask a blessing upon all those that hear it and that their hearts will be receptive and that we'll all understand that the gospel often causes us to suffer but we as mature Christians should accept that suffering to alleviate some of the suffering that young Christians, immature Christians go through so that they will be nurtured into a mature relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.